Well, good morning. It's great to see each of you today, and we're all ready for Christmas, and we're going to worship the Lord today and celebrate to all together. Would you stand, and would you welcome those around you as we prepare for our worship time?
Hear the word of the Lord from the book of Isaiah. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. We have lit all four candles of the Advent wreath, and that means Christmas is here. And I'm glad you've come today to help us celebrate the birth of Jesus. We've got tomorrow night, of course, and you're all invited back for that. But I'm glad you're here today. A lot of our folks are already gone to visit loved ones, family, and friends all around the world. But you're here. And if you're our guest today, I want to welcome you especially and ask you if you are a first timer, if you'll take your program and find that panel that asks some information. If you don't mind, tell us about yourself. We, we want to know more about you and we hope you'll come back again. Well, we are in the Lottie Moon season all December. We're raising money for international missions. And our team from here that went to Bulgaria got home safely last night, and we praise God for that. But I want you to watch this video, would you? How can I make sure that what I do as a physician demonstrates the love of God and the mercy of God and the hope of God? From an early point in my childhood, I can remember watching the first moon landing on a black and white TV and thinking, I want to do that job. Um, so I just pursued that. And then was able to get into an aerospace medicine residency program to work for NASA as a flight surgeon, providing health care for the astronauts and their families. It really was a dream come true. But in many ways, my identity was not as a follower of Jesus Christ, but my identity had become, I'm a flight surgeon working for NASA. I really didn't think that I would leave NASA. God said, you need to make a choice. Is it our living room? I'm saying to God, this job is cool, but I don't need it, I need you. Whatever you want to do, I'm ready. When he finally came to me and told me that this is what he felt called to do, I just said, I've been waiting. God uh, moved us to the country of Uganda where we served for 12 and a half years. From there, moved south to Lesotho, and then God brought us to Kigoma Baptist Hospital where we've been serving for the last seven years. In Western Tanzania, it, it literally is at the end of the road because we're right on the Lake Tanganyika. God has placed us in an area that is predominantly Islamic. Healthcare in our part of the world, there is a great limitation on resources that are available. We have patients that are admitted with severe malaria, dysentery. Every year we have an outbreak of cholera. We don't have the adequate numbers of resources and personnel on the field to be able to meet all the needs. But we have partnerships with a number of different churches and on various levels. 
when a church comes in and partners with us to provide that kind of care, it literally changes the, the people's lives, both physically but also spiritually. Using healthcare strategies is like a key that opens the door to get into a village that we might not have access to. Not far outside of the town that we live in is a small village. Completely unreached on the fringes of town. We met with local leaders and we asked permission to come to that village and do a week-long medical dental eye clinic. Through that opportunity, uh, God used that to start a new church plant. That village has been a huge impact. Growing in their faith in Jesus Christ and being discipled. Just this past week, one person came and repented and said, no, I need this Jesus. The kingdom of light is coming in Tanzania, bursting through the darkness like we've never seen before. It is our privilege to go, also to give, and I pray you will do that as God leads you. As we come to year end, you can give certainly to the ongoing ministry of your church, uh, but don't forget international missions, and we are accepting those gifts through the end of this month. And it's all of our privilege to pray, so I want you to join with me now. Father, it is good to be here today. We're so thankful for what you're doing in the world through missionaries with the wonderful news of Jesus. And Lord, thank you for letting this church be a big part of that. We pray as, that, as we go, we would go with your power upon us. As we pray that you would hear and answer our prayers. And as we give, you would meet the needs of missionaries and causes around the world. We commit this day to you. We listen for your voice. And if you speak to us today, we will obey. Through Christ we pray. Amen. It's wonderful this morning to have our youth choir join with the adult choir. Many of the adults are on vacation and out of town. A great choir this morning to share with you. Mary, did you know? And our soloist is Brianna Jones. This is a piece that we did back for the first family Christmas. Later on in worship today, you're going to hear from James Fleshman, who's going to share a worship solo. He is uh, at Judson University in Chicago and one of our former youth. It's good to have these young people leading us in worship today.
sing, would you? Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give your name to one. Jesus Christ is born. Man and beast before him bow when he is born to death. Christian men rejoice. so much. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. You know, in the first service, I wasn't expecting a response, but this church is so responsive, and I love that, and it's something that I've missed while I've been away from you all. So thank you uh, for having me back. It's great to see everyone. And um, I know this song may be new to a lot of you, but I pray that it would help you to worship our God this morning. It's called From Jesus' Side. from Jesus' side, saints of God and heirs with Christ. The veil was torn, creation cried, the bride was born from Jesus' side. Man was fashioned. 
ashen from the dust Molded by the hands of one Who breathed to life in earthly sun Made for fellowship with God Born of wounds from Adam's side Given to a man a bride They made a tryst with sin and die And birthed the fall of all mankind Saints of God and theirs with Christ The veil was torn, creation cried Pride was born from Jesus' side The child of wrath is brought to life. I was born from Jesus' side. I was born from Jesus' side. From Jesus' side, saints of God and heirs with Christ. The veil was torn, creation cried. The bride was born from Jesus' side. The bride was born from Jesus' side. Thank you, James. Thank it's you. good to have you. Good to have you home. Well, I don't know what kind of week you've had, but it's been a difficult week for a lot of our folks. We had two funerals this week. Other folks had some surgery and some surgeries scheduled for January. Some got good news, some got bad news. But all of us need prayer. And I'm wondering, maybe today you are one of those that just needs your church family to pray for you. And if you are that one, I want you to come. I'll lead us in prayer. But if you want to be included, join me up here for just a moment, would you? God in heaven, the angel announced peace on earth, and still it is so elusive. We still long for there to be peace in this world, 
And so we pray for our leaders around the world that you would move in a mighty way during these days to bring about peace. And in all of our lives, there are unsettling times that come, sometimes with the word from a doctor, sometimes a problem at home or at work. And we need you more than ever. Today, we bring our burdens and we lay them down. We will take you at your word when you promise peace and hope. Lord, we trust you for the answer, even though we don't yet see it. We thank you for what is to be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. I stand ready before God. I am an angel, a messenger of the Most High. I've traveled far and wide carrying out God's commands, and I have done this for a long time. Some of the messages I bring are warnings, some bad news, but others are wonderful proclamations. One season was especially so full of good tidings that I was busier than normal, but I was honored to be the one to share this special message. I began by shocking an old priest speechless with news that his aged wife was to have a son, John. They didn't know it yet, but John would prepare the way of the Lord. And next, I surprised a humble young woman, Mary. I told her she was highly favored of God and that she would conceive and give birth to God's son. I told Mary she was to call the boy Jesus and that he would reign over the house of Jacob forever, and that his kingdom would never end. Now, I told Mary's fiancé to stay with her. I explained to him that this child was from the Holy Spirit, and that he would save his people from their sins. Oh, the night of Jesus' birth was a huge celebration. Myself and a few of my friends, okay, it, it was more like an army of us, We terrified a group of shepherds as we proclaimed the birth of God's son, singing glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to all. Oh, and the shepherds, they understood. They wasted no time. They left immediately to seek out and find this baby. Another group was also among the first I informed of these events. I aided some wise men in their discovery of a new star that heralded the birth of a savior. And then I influenced them in their long journey west to find and worship this baby. All these messages may seem unrelated, but they're not. Their singular purpose is to focus the attention of the world on the birth of God's son so that everyone would know God loves them enough. Oh, so that you would know God loves you enough to send and to give over his son for you. That was, and it still is, the greatest message ever. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, Scott, and all who have done these wonderful monologues for us during Advent. I invite your attention to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. Matthew, chapter 2. We've been talking about going backstage at the Christmas play, and we uh, had auditions for the parts, and we learned our lines. We got the backstory down in our hearts, and today we're going to talk about getting the props in place. You got to have props for a play. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and following. 
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord for us today. As important as are the actors on the stage are the people who build the props behind the stage. Weeks ahead of time, they're hard at work getting everything ready so that when the curtain comes up, the plot is focused. Strategically placed props give clues as to what's going to be happening in the action once it gets started. I mean, if you go to a play and the curtain opens and you see on the table a telephone, an old-fashioned telephone, well, you know that sometime during the play that phone's going to ring with an important message that's essential to the plot. If you're sitting there and you see on the table a gun, a revolver, well, you know somebody's not making it out of Act, of act 3. And if it's a Hallmark movie and you see mistletoe anywhere, you know somebody is going to get kissed before the play is over. The props are important. And those who build them are important. Sometimes we think the only way you can serve God is to be one of the actors on the stage, a preacher or a singer, somebody like that, a missionary. And, and yes, you do serve God in those roles, but I mean, how many people are we talking about? You serve God too in your field of work. In Exodus chapter 35, I'm just going to read it to you. We meet Bezalel in Aholib. Uh, Moses is trying to get the tabernacle built and he's getting all the resources and everything together. In chapter 35, verse 30, then Moses said to the Israelites, see, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he's filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. And he's given both him and Aholib, son of Ahizamek, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He's filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as engravers, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, and weavers, all of them, skilled workers and designers. So Bezalel, Aholib, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Artisans, stonemasons, carpenters, you serve God too. 
If you need a plumber at your house, don't call me. A preacher cannot help you when your uh, pipes are all uh, clogged up. You need a skilled plumber. When your air conditioning or your heat goes out, don't call me. Don't call a missionary. Call somebody in HVAC and see if they can help you. God uses everybody who will make himself or herself available. He's inspired you and uses you too. And so the builder of the props. When Will Williman was the dean of the chapel at Duke University, on one occasion he asked the custodian if he could go up into the ceiling, into the rafters. If you ever have a chance to go to Duke University, take the opportunity to walk their beautiful campus. This chapel was built in 1932, but it was built to look like an ancient cathedral. And so he went up in the rafters. If you could get into our sanctuary now, and you can't, but if you could get in there, you'd see that the ceiling is now gone and the rafters are exposed. Well, Willeman was up there at Duke and, and he's looking. And over in the corner, he sees in pencil, somebody had written John Scavani for the glory of God. And he realized this John Scavani fella was one of the builders of that chapel back in 1932, a worker with his hands. And he didn't have any idea that anybody would ever see what he had written. He didn't write it for people. He wrote it for God. And he was building that chapel for God, for the glory of God. Take pride in what God's called you to do and do everything you do for his honor and glory. And if you're in some kind of field where you can't do it for God, maybe you're in the wrong place. Let's talk about the props. The, the curtain is about to open, and uh, here are the props. First of all, there is a scroll on the table, and it is dusty. The wise men come to town. They are taken to the king. Where is the Messiah to be born? And the king doesn't know. You would think he would know a thing like that, but he doesn't. He consults his uh, scribes and the teachers of the law. And they remember the scroll. And so they go over and they, whoosh, they blow the dust off of it. They unravel it. And there they find the prophecy from Malachi from Micah, rather, chapter, Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, records it. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That old scroll actually had foretold the exact location of the Messiah's birth. How's that for being, for being able to pinpoint something? It'll be in Bethlehem. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, A virgin will conceive and bring forth a son whose name will be called Emmanuel. A virgin birth foretold hundreds of years before it happened. And then in Isaiah chapter 9, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All of this written 700 years or more before it actually took place in time and space. It was all in the old scroll. So when you see a scroll on the platform, you know there's some secrets in there that need to be known the children of Israel had been waiting a long, long time. They'd been waiting so long that most of them had forgotten about it. But God had made a promise. And some, like aged Simeon, you read about in Luke chapter 2, some had never lost their hope. They were still waiting. And that reminds me that God's timetable is different from mine. Sometimes we have to wait for the answer to come. Are you good at waiting? I'm not very... Anybody here uh, doesn't do well with waiting? Okay, I'm the only one. But I, okay, I see a few hands. I have trouble with it. Children do at Christmas time, waiting for Christmas morning. But all of us struggle. Yesterday, late afternoon, Audrey sent me to Trader Joe's to pick up something. One loaf of bread 
And so I went there and the place was jammed and I got the loaf of bread and I, I got in line and uh, it was a long, long line. And the guy standing in front of me says, well, you're as foolish as I am, sir. <laughs> and I, I said, excuse me? He said, you come in here and you got one thing and look at, look at all these, these people. And uh, up in front of him was a woman who had a cart jam-packed with everything you need for Christmas and New Year's. And not just in the buggy itself, but underneath. You know how that is. You can fill that up too. And this man in front of me was just increasingly agitated. He wanted things to move on, but it, but it wasn't moving because she had to price check. And, and then the, uh, the, the girl behind the, at the register had to also do the packing of the bags. And he was just getting frustrated and he loudly complained about it. And uh, he looked at me and he said, aren't you upset? And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And I really was because if I knew if I went home, Audrey had all kinds of things for me to do. <laughs> and if I went home, I'd have to be gift wrapping presents and things. So I had all the time in the world. I'm just standing there <laughs> trying to encourage this guy. Finally, he, he goes through, and now it's my turn. And the, and the young lady at the cash register, she was muttering under her breath, as you can imagine. And she said, people just don't understand that I can't help how long the lines are. And I said, I know, it's Christmas, and you're doing a great job. Smile, you'll get through this. We have to wait sometimes. You've prayed about something, and it hasn't happened yet. You're wondering, is God ever going to come through for me? God's timing is different from ours. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways and my thoughts are higher than yours. We simply don't know what God is up to. He's always working. He's always there. We need to trust him. Lamentations 3 verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. So don't give up. And don't settle for second best or shortcuts. But wait and trust God to answer in his time. He finally did in the coming of the Messiah. Uh, the, the New Testament says when the fullness of time had come. Uh, some translations say when the time was exactly right, God sent forth his son into the world. So you got that dusty scroll. Now it's not in Matthew chapter 2, but from Luke 2, we know there was also a manger. This is going to be a lowly welcome when Messiah is born. A manger. Now, a manger is a low trough filled with feed or fodder. It was a place for animals. Not where you would expect a king to be born. A king would be born in a beautiful palace today in the best hospital in the country. But Jesus was born in a feeding trough. We're learning something. When you see that manger on the platform, that ought to prompt your memory that Jesus came humbly to this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. He left it all. He emptied himself, Philippians 2 says. He emptied himself of his divine prerogatives that he might walk on this earth as a human being, as a man. And not just a man, but a servant. And not just a servant, but one who would die. So Paul would say, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. If you look closely at the feeding trough, you might see some swaddling clothes hanging off the side. Swaddling clothes, this translation says cloths. You'd wrap a baby in them like a diaper 
But those same cloths would be used when somebody was injured, their wounds would be bandaged. And those same cloths would be used when somebody died, they'd be wrapped in those swaddling clothes. A little picture, just a prompt to let you know what's coming, that this baby's going to grow up and one day he's going to die. Back in Matthew chapter 2, we see another prop, and this uh, took more than one person to do. The hanging of a star, a glowing star, a lingering wonder in the sky. It was that star that guided the Magi to Bethlehem. Now, down through history, folks have tried to identify this star as some sort of constellation or a, uh, a planet or two, some event that they can trace back. I don't know. I, I don't worry about those things. This star is different than anything we know anything about. This star moved, and this star stopped over the house in Bethlehem. This is sometime after Jesus' birth because Jesus is no longer in the, in the, uh, the uh, cow stall, no longer laid in a feeding trough. Now he's in a house. So he's a year maybe or two of age. But these magi come following a star. This star, whatever it was, was simply doing what God made all stars to do. The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 19 verse 1. The stars, that full moon you enjoyed last night, that's there to declare the glory of God. The purpose of all stars. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60 and I'll just read this to you. Uh, Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And sure enough, those magi come to the light, the light shining in darkness. The star kind of reminds us of Jesus himself who would shine and shines to this day in a very dark world. Now, also on the stage, there is a table. And on top of the table are some gifts. These gifts are very special and they signify lavish worship. Common people could not do this. They would not have the resources. These magi are wealthy men and we think there were three. There might have been more, but they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What's the most expensive gift you've ever given or received? What's the most expensive gift you're going to give somebody this Christmas? It might be an engagement ring. I don't know. Let me know. I'd, I'd be interested. It might be something very expensive. On this weekend, back in 1864, the Civil War was in its last days. And William T. Sherman had already taken Atlanta and had his scorched earth uh, policy of moving across Georgia and finally, he got to Savannah. And uh, this weekend, all those years ago, the mayor of Savannah surrendered the city. And with that, the Civil War was essentially over. There'd be a few more months of it and a few more skirmishes, but the war was essentially over. When the mayor surrendered Savannah, Sherman sent a telegram to President Lincoln I beg to present to you as a Christmas present the city of Savannah. That's quite a present, a big, expensive present. The Magi bring very expensive gifts, and, and we think this is where the custom of giving at Christmas started. But not really. It all started 
with God's amazing gift, his indescribable gift, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God started it by giving you the most expensive gift in eternity. And the wise men pick it up, and now we give gifts today. And it's all right to give lavishly. They're giving gifts fit for a king. Gold, that's what you would give to royalty. Frankincense, that's a, that's a, that's a fragrant perfume that would be used in worship. So this symbolizes perhaps the, the deity of Jesus. And then myrrh. Myrrh was also a kind of perfume, but it would be used for the dead. It would be used for embalming. Reminding us of his humanity. He was a king, but he was God and man at the same time. So in gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we get a hint, just a hint of what is to come. The baby's going to grow up, and one day he's going to give his life for you and for me. And so he did. These props on the table before any action takes place. Let us know what's going to happen. And now you know. I hope you've given your life to Christ. I hope you're trusting in him. He came for you. He died for you. He, he came to bring light for your dark world. And the only proper response is what the shepherds did when they left their sheep and came into the town. And what the wise men did when they came with their gifts. So you come to Jesus and give him everything you have. Let's pray. Would you bow with me, please? We're going to sing in a moment, and I'm going to invite you if you've never said yes to Jesus and received the wonderful gift God sent to you in him, I want you to get up and come to the front and let me know it. I'll pray with you about it. If you've given your life to Jesus, but never publicly, you need to do it publicly. So I invite you to come. You ought to be baptized in the weeks to come. So come today and let us know. And if you want to be a part of a church like this, where you can worship lavishly, the King of Kings, you come and present yourself. Just tell me, and I know our church will receive you. Father, bless now these who've heard your word today, and I pray we will respond accordingly. Through Christ the Lord we pray. Amen. Let's stand. My child is this.
Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be here today. Uh, we sing songs of worship like joy to the world, and we know that there's joy in our world today because of the greatest gift that's ever been given, the greatest gift we'll ever know. And Lord, we pray that um, as we worship you and as we come here, that we learn to be props and to be actors in your story, that we may better spread the message of Christ to everyone we meet. And Lord, part of that is uh, this time of giving, and we pray over these tithes and these offerings that may, they may further grow your kingdom here on earth. In all these things we pray, amen. Merry Christmas. Thank you for sharing this Sunday with us. It's good to see all of you. We've got not just James uh, Fleshman here, but we've got other college students who are normally far away. They're with us today, and it's always good to welcome them home. Some are staying a few weeks. Some, this is going to be the only time you'll see them. So yeah, give them a warm greeting and let them know you're glad they're home too. Well, you've got your program in hand. On the back, you see a listing of events Bleeding over into the new year, there's a lot there about January, but you're not interested in January. You're just interested in Christmas, so it's hard to announce these things, but I don't want you to miss out the things that are coming right after Christmas is over, so get ready. It's going to be a great year for you and for our church, and uh, so be a part of it. Tomorrow night, Christmas Eve, I want you to know we want you to be here for the candlelight carols and communion service. We've got two of them, one at 5 and the other at 6.30. Come and bring your family, your friends with you. It's beautiful. They'll hear the gospel proclaimed in a winsome manner that won't offend, that won't drive them away. You won't be embarrassed. You bring them, and they will appreciate the service when they share it with you. We have child care in both hours, but I got to tell you, we still need some volunteers to help with that. So the best thing you could do, especially if you don't have children now of your own at home, little ones, come to one service and volunteer in the other. It's an hour. The services are each one hour long. Volunteer. See Kim today or email her and let her know you'd be able to help. That would, that would be a blessing. We want to be good hosts tomorrow night. 
and uh, that would be so very helpful. Okay? All right, let's stand together. We'll sing and we'll go. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody.